you everyone for coming out tonight. This is going to be an amazing session. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And here is what we're here to talk about tonight, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. Let me just try to set that up. Michael, I have been a fan of your work for a very long time. As a reader, I've enjoyed everything you've written and I've always loved seeing what you were going to write about next. But as a writer and one who also writes about science, I've often looked to your writing to see how you solve problems, hmm. how you negotiate that really tricky space between narrative and idea, how you introduce characters, how you talk about place and how you bring it all together. You cover so much in your writing. And I particularly love in Michael's writing the themes that recur again and again, the themes of transformation in particular. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the transformation of wild into domesticated, of matter into food, of, of nature into something other than nature. And, and you ask in so many different ways how we change nature and how nature changes us. So, when I read this book, I knew that I was going to learn about transformation. I knew that I was going to learn just a lot of stuff that I didn't know before, and I knew that I would come away with a sense that what had been familiar somehow looked a little bit different to me. And you did all of that. What I didn't expect in this book was a treatise on middle age. And what it's like to be, sort of assumptions aside about what that is, what does it mean to be a creature who lives for a really long time and thinks for a really long time? I didn't expect to think so much about spirituality and about existence. And I didn't expect to find it all so deeply emotionally moving, but I found it to be an incredibly emotional book. When I finished the book, it made perfect sense to me that you had written it. But I did not see this one coming. I did not yeah. see Michael Pollan and psychedelics <laughs> in the same sentence. Were you surprised to find yourself writing about psychedelics? Well, thanks for those comments. They're um, very acute. I think I do write about transformation. I think that is kind of my master subject, I realized uh, some time ago. Uh, I was, it was not in my life plan to either use psychedelics or write a book about them. Um, and the last time I was on this stage, um, some of you may remember, I think it was seven years ago, I was talking about food. And some of you perhaps came to hear me talk about food. I'll talk about mushrooms, <laughs> but that's going to be the extent of it, I think. Um, but, you know, I sort of see my subject as a writer as being the human engagement with the natural world and how we change nature and nature changes us. And it's a very complicated... Uh, I mean, I've really been working on that, the, the questions that, that that relationship poses. The very fact that we have a relationship to nature. What other creature has to have a relationship to nature? They just are nature. Um, and so I had, you know, written several books on food and was very engaged by that topic. But at a certain point, I think you can know too much to write about something, at least the way I like to write about it. I mean, as journalists, our great privilege is that we get to learn whole new subjects as adults, you know, yeah. without going back to school. And um, I like writing from a position of ignorance or naivete. I think if you read the first page of any of my books, I'm kind of an idiot. And the book is very much the story of my educated, my right. education. Um, so, in a way, in, in retrospect, these things are, make sense. Um, long before I wrote about food, I, I was writing about nature more directly and gardening and plants. And in Botany of Desire, which is my third book, I wrote about four plants and, and our reciprocal relationship with them. One of them was a, a psychoactive plant, cannabis. Right. And it was at that point I got really curious about the fact that you know, we use, we use plants for beauty, we use them for food, we use them for clothing, um, but then there's this really weird use, which is taking plants into our body, or, or fungi, um, to change consciousness. And that's a, that turns out to be a universal human desire. Every species, uh, every culture on Earth that's been looked at, with one exception, uh, uses some plant 
or fungus to change consciousness. And it, it could be as simple as tea or coffee, um, not that those are so simple, but you know, uncontroversial to using these radical substances that radically change consciousness. The exception are the Inuit. Yeah. Um, and it's only because nothing good grows where they live. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, when they get to Canada or wherever they might immigrate, they, uh, they get with the program pretty quickly. Um, and so I've been curious about that desire. And then when I started hearing that psychedelics were being used in, uh, you know, rigorous research trials uh, as a medicine, uh, that just seemed irresistible. That, it, that was something I had to look at. And, um, and and it was certainly something I could write about as an idiot since <laughs> I didn't know very much about the brain or the mind or all yes. the issues that they rose, uh, that they brought up. And, and once you started looking into the research on the clinical applications of psychedelic drugs, you discovered that there was this enormous wealth of research that had been lost, that had been kind of disappeared from the record, that had occurred in the 60s and even beforehand as well. In the 50s well. too. So what did you learn? What were people looking at and what did they discover in the 50s and 60s? Yeah, I think like most people, I thought psychedelics were a, a, a manifestation of the 60s. Um, you know, the word psychedelic has a very 60s connotation, but in fact it's a 50s word. It was, uh, it was coined in 57. Um, and so I was really surprised to learn, and indeed many of the researchers were surprised to learn, that there had been this long history of serious work uh, beginning in the late 40s, all the way through the 50s, through most of the 60s. Um, and by the time psychedelics came onto the radar for most people, and, and came onto the radar of the powers that be, who ended up crushing it, um, a lot of work had been done. It began with Albert Hoffman, the, uh, who, who, who invented uh, or first synthesized LSD. He was, he was a chemist at Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland, now I think a part of Novartis. And he was looking for a drug to help women in childbirth, to help with bleeding. And ergot, the fungus, had been used in folk medicine for that purpose um, for many years. So they thought, well, maybe they could derive um, a new molecule from that uh, ergotamine, it's called, uh, that would have this effect. And he did a whole bunch of these derivations, and the 25th one, um, which was called LSD-25, um, he he, they did some animal tests on it, nothing much happened, and he put it on the shelf. Um, this was in 1938. In 1943, in the middle of the war, some, he does something very odd and out of character, which is he has a premonition that this particular molecule was so beautiful that he had to take another look at it. So he synthesized it again. And um, in the process of doing that, he accidentally ingested a little bit. He got some on his skin or in his eye and realized he had a powerful psychoactive drug uh, of some kind. And he then proceeded to take a deliberate dose and he, and he started, he thought, really small uh, with 250 micrograms of LSD. And there's some knowing laughter, which is not a small dose, but LSD is like the most powerful chemical I think we found in terms of psychoactive drugs, and it's measured in micrograms, which are millionths of a gram. So it seemed like a very modest dose, but in fact, it was, a, it was the world's first acid trip. Wow. And he, uh, he's in his office, in his lab, and he realizes that he's not right in the head and it was kind of scary and the furniture is starting to move and the walls are shimmering and, and he, he realized he's got to get home and, uh, and his young lab assistant, uh, he has to take him, get him home and it was wartime so there was gasoline rationing so he takes a bicycle. The two of them <laughs> have this, I imagine, this very wobbly bike ride. Is it ride. the same bicycle? Uh, or two bicycles? Two bicycles. They okay. each had a bicycle. All right. um, she was probably not wobbling, but she was probably <laughs> nervous because here yeah. was her boss who was freaking out. And um, they get home, and he tells her to summon the doctor. And the um, doctor comes and says, basically, you're fine. Your pupils are a little dilated, but your vitals are all fine. Which, and this allowed him to relax a little. And what had been a, a, a frightening trip gradually morphed into a very pleasant trip. And he goes out in his garden and he describes the dew on all the plants and he felt like Adam on the first day of creation. And um, this begins this uh, period of research because 
Sandoz knows they've got something powerful here, but they have no idea what it's good for. Right. Um, and they go through this series of different paradigms. Um, one is that it's a, what they call a psychotomimetic, uh, a drug that mimics psychosis, and perhaps it could be useful to understand the mind of the schizophrenic, and that therapists would take it and learn what it was like to be crazy. And, but some therapists started taking it, and they said, I don't think this is like schizophrenia. This is too, too good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they kind of develop these other paradigms and they go through a series and, and, and um, there was a psycholytic paradigm where they would give small doses like 50 or 75 micrograms to people in talk therapy and it would just kind of loosen, psycholytic means mind loosening and it would loosen right. people up and they'd get in touch, conscious, unconscious material would come to the, to the fore and they could deal with it. It's an interesting paradigm, I don't know why anyone isn't doing that now um, because it, it showed some real promise. And then there was the psychedelic paradigm, where you have um, a, a, a transformative experience you, that's very mystical. You may undergo this ego dissolution. And this seemed to be able to kind of reboot the minds. I and mean, that was not the kind of metaphor I was used in the 50s, but um, uh, help people break addictions, depression. And so all this work was going on. And to give you an idea how extensive this research program was, there were um, 40,000 research subjects who were given LSD or psilocybin. There were 1,000 peer-reviewed papers published. And there were six international conferences it's on LSD. I don't know of another case in science where such an active and promising line of inquiry is stopped for essentially political reasons. But that's what happened. And um, uh, the 60s, you know, LSD and psilocybin escaped the laboratory, is the metaphor you usually hear, and became part of the counterculture, and, and, um, and was very uh, disruptive to the culture in ways that led to a, a backlash. Right, and that's when the crackdown occurred. And, yeah, and even though they never banned the research, it became, scientists were uncomfortable researching something that was so controversial. There was the snicker factor, or you're working on yeah. LSD, and, um, and so gradually the funding dries up and everybody stops. And so you have 30 years where no work is done or very little work is done. The Swiss kept at it actually quietly. Did they through yeah. that time? Well, I don't think the Swiss were party to the drug treaties that were, that, you know, the UN had everybody, or the US really forced everybody to sign. Right. And um, so they continued to do some work. But basically it, it, goes, it goes dormant for a long period of time. And I think now how much progress could have been made in that 30 years that we would have, I think, um, a very useful tool in the, in the pharmacopoeia to, to help deal with mental illness that, right. that we, I think we'll have soon, but um, right, so we could have had it a lot earlier. A lot of suffering could have been averted. Yes, yeah. Um, but maybe soon because now we're at perhaps the dawn is the right word, the beginnings of a, of a renaissance in that kind of research, and that's happening in different places across the world. And you describe so many incredible cases where um, many scientists are sort of picking up from those ideas or yeah. those experiments. and replicating those early experiments. Right, and doing it perhaps in a more rigorous yeah. kind well, of way. Well, the whole idea of the gold standard, placebo-controlled, uh, double-blind study, didn't exist in the 50s. Right. That really was a product of the thalidomide scandal in 1962, where drug, drugs could get on the market very easily before that, and there was this uh, drug, uh, I think it was a sedative given to pregnant women that led to um, you know, terrible birth defects, and that led to a, a new regulatory regime and a lot more controls. So it was necessary to repeat those experiments, and right. that's what's happening now. Right. Um, and a lot of the same indications are being tested, um, the most exciting, and actually the experiment that got me, uh, you know, began my research was looking at uh, giving psychedelics to people with cancer diagnoses. Can you tell us terminal. a story? You, you tell incredible stories about people's experience of yeah. living with those diagnoses and then having psychedelic, a sort of psychedelic assisted therapy and really transforming their sense yeah. of what it means to die. So Yeah, those were, they were remar some of the most remarkable and moving interviews and tearful interviews I've ever conducted as a journalist. Um, I began talking to patients 
uh, who had volunteered for a trial that was going on at New York University in Manhattan and at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And they basically did the same trial in two sites. And these were really pioneering uh, trials. And what they were doing was they had people who s s were suffering from what they call existential distress. It's the, f the combination of fear and anxiety and depression that can often accompany uh, cancer diagnosis. And not everybody was terminal, many people were. Others were, were paralyzed by the fear of recurrence. Uh, and I'll give you an example of one woman in that category who I, I interviewed, who, who's quite remarkable. Uh, her name was Dina Baser. She was 60. She, she was a figure skating instructor uh, who, who lived and worked in Manhattan. And she had had ovarian cancer. And it was successfully treated, it was in remission. Um, but she was paralyzed by the fear of recurrence, that this other shoe was going to drop any day, and she really was not functional. Um, she, hears, she hears about this trial and, and enters into it. And I should explain kind of what, what happens when you're in the trial, because yeah. the, way, the way psychedelics are being used in this research or, or therapeutic context is very different than the, the so-called recreational use. Um, you are prepared very carefully by uh, two guides, uh, usually trained therapist or um, licensed therapist of some kind, and they tell you what to expect, um, and they tell you how to deal with difficult material that may come up, because the bad trip is real, and people can get into terrifying places. Um, and they tell you how to deal with that. Um, and the main advice is um, surrender to whatever's happening. So, you know, they'll tell you, if you feel like you're going crazy, melting, dying, don't fight it. Uh, and the bad trip is very often the, the, the ego's defense against that, that gravitational right. pull of dissolution, and that can make you very anxious. Uh, if you see a monster, walk right up to it. Ask it, what are you doing in my head? What do you have to teach me? Um, and if you go toward things, trust and let go, um, you're much more likely to have a positive experience and work through any negative experiences. So they give you that kind of preparation. Um, then during the experience, then you get your pill. It's a synthetic uh, version of psilocybin, uh, 25 milligrams, which is a substantial dose. It's equivalent to about four or five grams, uh, for those of you keeping score, and um, uh, of, of, of a dried mushroom. Um, and the, the guides sit with you the entire time. Um, they don't say very much but they're available if you need to hold a hand or um, need anything, need to get up and use the bathroom. And they take notes on anything you say and they chart your blood pressure and things like that. And they're trying not to direct it. The theory of psychedelic therapy is the mind goes where it needs to go. Right. And you shouldn't uh, try to program it too much. And then, they, uh, and then after the experience, you come back the following day, you write a whole report on what happened. You come back the following day and tell the story of your, of your journey. And with the guide's help, you try to make sense of it and apply it to your life um, and, 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 and take lessons from it. Because um, it can be a very confusing experience. And this is called an integration session. It's a very important part of it. Many people have had profound experiences on psychedelics that they didn't know what they meant right. or how to deal with them. And so, and this happens with young people especially, so they put them in this box called weird drug experience, which isn't that useful. Because um, it's not a drug experience, really. I mean, everything that happens is a product of your mind. It has some significance for you. So it shouldn't be, def it shouldn't be dismissed like that. Um, so that's what, so that's, the, that's what this woman went through, like all the other patients. Um, so like a lot of the cancer patients, Dina went into her body in this, in this kind of waking dream that, that is the psychedelic journey. She goes into her body and she sees this black mass underneath her rib cage. And she knows it's not her cancer, it's in the wrong place, but she recognizes it immediately. And she realizes that's her fear this black mass of fear. And spontaneously, she screams at it. Now imagine these two guides sitting with her, and she's a very small, timid woman, and suddenly they hear her say, get the fuck out of my body. <laughs> and with that, it just goes off in a puff of smoke, and it's gone. Wow. And she said, from that moment on, her fear was gone. 
And that was, I thought that was so remarkable. And I, I was describing this in, uh, I, I, read, I wrote an article for The New Yorker that I then decided uh, to expand into a book. Um, and I put it in, and you'll know this as, a, as someone who's wrangled with New Yorker fact checkers, and, I, and I, you know, just to be careful, I said, and her fear was substantially diminished. And uh, they called her and they read the quote, and she said, um, you know, that's totally wrong. My fear was completely extinguished. Wow. That's not usually how it goes with yeah, the fact checkers. Yeah, it's not. It was yeah. quite, yeah, exactly. That you actually get to strengthen a <laughs> sentence rather than weaken it. It's usually a process of dilution. Yeah. Um, and she, um, she went on to have this very blissful experience, and she described it. She told me she was an atheist at the beginning, and because, uh, you know, spirituality came up in all these interviews, which was part of what was so weird and uncomfortable about them in some ways. Yeah. But it, it became much more comfortable as time went on. Um, and she said she'd kiss the face of God. And I said, well, you, said you told me you were an atheist, so you're no longer an atheist? She said, oh, no, I'm still an atheist. I said, well, how could you kiss the face of God? And she said, well, we just don't have a word big enough for what I felt. Wow. So I'm using the biggest word we have. That's God. Um, so anyway, that, those are the kind of stories I heard. And uh, Dina, as far as I know, is still alive. Um, I also interviewed many people who aren't. And their stories, too, were remarkable. Yeah. And um, uh, so this tr I think this is a really significant trial. If you think what we have to offer people in this situation, it's essentially morphine. Yeah. You know, which may help with pain, but it doesn't help with existential pain or suffering. Um, and, and it tends to cloud the mind. And these people all had experiences of incredible clarity uh, near the end. Um, and I'm very excited to, to learn, having come here, that there is a trial for the same indication for cancer that will be starting at St. Vincent's Hospital. Wow. Um, right here in Melbourne. Are you following that? Are you going to follow that? I'll definitely follow it. I'm, yeah. I'm in touch with a couple of the researchers who are involved, and um, uh, so psychedelic science is coming to uh, to Australia, which is great. Even here in Melbourne. <laughs> So you practice immersion journalism, which means that you don't just come at a subject from the outside, you try to get inside and as best you can have the experience that you're actually writing about that other people have as well, which means that for this book, you took a number of psychedelic trips and I found it um, both fascinating and I think endearing in a way the, the tone of measured skepticism and caution that you maintained throughout this book. And of course, that's such a critical tool of journalism. And, and I think the, the necessity for it in this particular case was even higher. You know, you don't want to be credulous when you're writing about something like drugs or psychedelic drugs in particular. But how much was that sense of reserve Michael Pollan, the journalist, and how much was it Michael Pollan, the late in life or later in life drug user? Yeah, no, I was, uh, I, I mean, I was skeptical in some ways, but I was also really reluctant. I am a, the most reluctant psychonaut. Um, so <laughs> you should know that I hadn't really had experience of psychedelics at the age appropriate stage of life. Um, in, in my 20s and my teens, I was too afraid to, to, to use them. I just didn't feel I was sturdy enough. And I came of age, I, I'm a little too young for kind of peak 60s experience. And, um, and so by the time the idea of taking a psychedelic swam into my conscious awareness, um, the horror stories were all out there. You know, the trip from which someone never came back. The, uh, somebody thinking they could fly and jumping off of buildings and, um, you know. Did, did you personally know anyone? Who no, had, this no. was, a lot of this was propaganda that was in, right. the, in the media. I mean, the media went through, through a 180. I mean, the media was so enthusiastic about psychedelics right up to 1965. You can almost mark it. And Time Life, which was the, which was the most important media organization, or one of them in the United States, was so enthusiastic about psychedelics that um, Henry Luce, Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce, his wife, who owned Time Life, uh, had had psychedelic therapy in LA in the 50s, and, and it was very positive for both of them. So he had a rule that any article about psychedelics had to come to his desk to make sure there was nothing negative in it. <laughs> so, but that changes in 65 with this moral panic. 
And, and I was so, I, that was the information I uh, took in. So I was really too, too afraid of them. Um, so along comes this project, and I know, I, to, I mean, my readers expect me to do what I'm describing. I, I did it for you, dear readers. Um, and, um, uh, but I was very nervous about it. I mean, I mean, doing psychedelics when you're like 58 or whatever I was is different than when you're 20. First of all, you have some judgment. Uh, <laughs> And you're not quite the risk taker no you offense, are at 20. Yeah, no offense. No, but we know now that the, the judgment part of the brain is poorly developed in a male of 20 years old. Um, and uh, much to the advantage of these mushrooms. Um, so, you know, I, I talked to my cardiologist about it in advance. I had a cardiologist. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the difference, actually. Yeah, that's a big difference. It's, and he actually gave me the green light on everything except MDMA, okay. um, uh, ecstasy. And um, so I was really nervous. And before every experience, I, I had a sleepless night. And this ping-ponging back and forth, like... So this is going to be a really interesting experience. You, you need, you know, it's it, you're going to learn something important about your mind. And this other voice was like, "Are you crazy? You're going up on top of this mountain with this guy you barely know." Because I was working with underground guides, I couldn't get into the trials, and he's totally off the grid. And you're going to let this guy give you LSD, and you know what happens if you have a heart attack? And is he going to call 911? Um, and and then this other voice would be, "Well, you've got a book to write. You have to do this." And, <laughs> the deadline in the end that yeah, always gets you. Yeah, so it was, um, I, didn't, I didn't embark on it lightly. No, I didn't. And um, in the event, every time I actually ingested the substance, the medicine, I was able to let go. Um, and Because I realized that other voice, the negative voice, that was my ego talking. That right. was my ego defending itself against the assault to come. Right. Because these drugs are an assault on the ego. And um, uh, so once I overcame that, um, I was able to really uh, have what for the most part were some incredibly positive, in some ways transformative, uh, educational, and, and in large part pleasurable experiences. Yes, well, and some of the most beautiful writing in the book is a description of those experiences. And I can only imagine how technically challenging that must have been to I was put those experiences I was almost into. as terrified of writing about yeah, the experiences, right. having them, because I don't know if you've read trip reports online, but they're really not the best <laughs> genre of literature. And well, you how did do you it write about this? I'd like you to read some of that. Can you read us a section of one of the trips that you took? I would be happy to. So I'm not going to ask this audience, but normally when I ask an audience, do you want to hear about a good trip or a bad trip? At least in America, they all say, bad trip. So I'm going to read you about, about one that you might call a bad trip, um, uh, although I, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that description because some very positive things came out of it. As the therapist would say, it was a challenging trip. <laughs> so just to set this up a little bit, one of the more obscure psychedelics I tried was something called 5-MeO-DMT. This... <laughs> There's one in every crowd. 5-MeO-DMT um, is not DMT. Um, that's another drug, and that's the chemical in ayahuasca. 5-MeO-DMT is the smoked venom of the Sonoran Desert toad. Now, you've got to give credit to a species that would figure that out. Um, and we did. I mean, like... Well, you just, if you eat the venom, you die. But how about if you smoke it? Uh, <laughs> let's try that. No, we've, we've tried a lot of things. Um, anyway, so I wasn't setting out to write about this one, and this one is not in the subject of much research, if any. Um, but uh, one of my sources said this woman's coming up from Mexico who has a lot of experience as she catches the toads. And it's important to understand that toads are not harmed in the making of the psychedelic, that you can sort of milk them. You basically squeeze this gland and you have a pane of glass. They're big toads. And uh, it sprays the glass and then overnight the venom dries and it kind of looks like brown sugar. And then you smoke it in a, a vaporizer. Um, 
And I talked to a friend who had had experience with this, and she had told me it was the Everest of psychedelics. <laughs> that scared me. Um, so I went to this, I went, I wasn't sure, I, got, I had a sleepless night as usual, I went to the place where we were going to do this, and I still wasn't sure I was going to do it. But um, the woman I call Rocio, my guide, uh, said, you can watch someone else first. And there was this young guy, this college kid, who was doing it for the second time, and he was a very low affect guy, and I watched him, and he was lying down, and he smoked this, and he lied down, and he looked like he was having a little nap, it didn't look like a crisis of any kind, and he woke up, and he seemed okay. So I thought, okay. Um, so anyway, you, you take one puff um, of this, and, um, and this is how the passage begins. I have no memory of ever having exhaled or of being lowered onto the mattress and covered with a blanket. All at once, I felt a tremendous rush of energy fill my head, accompanied by a punishing roar. I managed barely to squeeze out the words I had prepared, trust and surrender. These words became my mantra, but they seemed utterly pathetic, wishful scraps of paper in the face of this category five mental storm. Terror seized me, and then, like one of those flimsy wooden houses erected on Bikini Atoll to be blown up in the nuclear tests, I was no more blasted to a confetti cloud by an explosive force I could no longer locate in my head because it had exploded that too, expanding to become all that there was. Whatever this was, it was not a hallucination. A hallucination implies a reality and a point of reference and an entity to have it. None of those things remained. Unfortunately, the terror didn't disappear with the extinction of my eye. Whatever allowed me to register this experience, the, this post-egoic awareness I'd first experienced on mushrooms, was now consumed in the flames of terror too. In fact, every touchstone that tells us I exist was annihilated, and yet I remained conscious. Is this what death feels like? Could this be it? That was the thought, though there was no longer a thinker to have it. Here words fail. In truth, there were no flames, no blast, no thermonuclear storm. I'm grasping at metaphor in the hope of forming some stable and shareable concept of what was unfolding in my mind. In the event, there was no coherent thought, just pure and terrible sensation. Only afterward did I wonder if this was what the mystics called the mysterium tremendum, the blinding, unendurable mystery, whether of God or some other ultimate or absolute, before which humans tremble in awe. Aldous Huxley described it as the fear, quote, of being overwhelmed, of disintegrating under a pressure of reality greater than a mind accustomed to living most of the time in a cozy world of symbols could possibly bear. Oh, to be back in the cozy world of symbols. After the fact, I kept returning to one of two metaphors, and while they inevitably deform the experience, as any words or metaphors or symbols must, Ineffability is definitely a hallmark of the psychedelic experience. They at least allow me to grasp a hold of a shadow of it and perhaps share it. The first is the image of being on the outside of a rocket after launch. I'm holding on with both hands, legs clenched around it, while the rapidly mounting G-forces clutch at my flesh, pulling my face down into a taut grimace as the great cylinder rises through successive layers of clouds, exponentially gaining speed and altitude, the fuselage shuddering on the brink of self-destruction as it strains to break free of Earth's grip, while the friction it generates as it crashes through the thinning air issues in a deafening roar. It was a little like that. <laughs> the other metaphor was the Big Bang, but the Big Bang ran, run in reverse from our familiar world all the way back to a point before there was anything, no time or space or matter, only the pure unbounded energy that was all there was then before some imperfection, a ripple in its waveform, caused the universe of energy to fall into time, space, and matter. Rushing backwards through 14 billion years, I watched the dimensions of reality collapse one by one until there was nothing left, not even being, only the all-consuming roar. It was just horrible. <laughs> this is not an advertisement for 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, and then suddenly the devolution of everything into the nothingness of pure force reverses course. One by one, the elements of our universe begin to reconstitute themselves. The dimensions of time and space return first, blessing my still-scattered confetti brain with the cozy coordinates of place, 
this is somewhere. And then I slip back into my familiar eye like an old pair of slippers and soon after felt something I recognized as my body begin to reassemble. The film of reality was now running in reverse as if all the leaves that the thermonuclear blast had blown off the great tree of being and scattered to the four winds were suddenly to find their way back, fly up into the welcoming limbs of reality and reattach. The order of things was being restored, me notably included. I was alive. Um, I'll stop there, but the, uh, thank you. So there was this, I mean, what almost made the experience worthwhile, I mean, the cessation of pain can feel really good, right? Um, but what made it worthwhile was this wave of gratitude I felt after it was over, that I had a body, um, <laughs> that I had survived. And not only that, I mean, most of us have expressed gratitude for being alive at some point. I felt this profound sense of gratitude that there was anything, that there was something rather than nothing. Right. Um, so that's not something I'd ever thought about. But I got acquainted with the possibility that there could be a world, a moment in history, where there was nothing. Um, and that the fact that there is something is, is quite remarkable. Um, have you retained that sense of gratitude? Yeah, I have actually. I do think about that now yeah. and then. Um, Would uh, you do that again? No, 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 no. <laughs> No, and you know, I've asked other people, more experienced psychonauts than me, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a novice. Um, uh, I've told that story. I remember sitting around a table with a group of like Silicon Valley multimillionaires at a fundraiser, raising money for psychedelic research. And they said, did you have any bad experiences? And I told them this story. And there was a guy at the far end of this giant table. Um, uh, and he looked at me and he said, you didn't do enough. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's, you know, maybe it was that's... kind of a suborbital. I mean, I had the launch and my friend who said it was the Everest of psychedelics said after that rocky launch, you're kind of installed in the firmament as a, as a happy star. And I, never, and I was like the Mercury astronauts. I just went up okay. to the edge of space and came right down. So maybe, maybe I have to do more. But no, I, I'm not going to do that again. So, in I think it was an earlier trip um, with psilocybin, you brought more, or you tried to bring more of that sort of the empiricist, you tried to bring this sort of ability to measure and quantify, and you, you set up an experiment that you yeah. heard about. And, you know, you set it up very carefully beforehand. Can you tell us about what you were trying to achieve with that, and then what actually happened with that experiment? Yeah, so, I mean, I did this in the spirit of science, you know, amateur science. Um, uh, and um, one of the things I had learned was that a very important principle of cognition uh, called predictive coding uh, is um, upset by psychedelics, and that might explain some of how they work. So predictive coding is the idea that most of what we perceive is not the raw information we're getting from our senses, but is rather a, uh, a guess, a best guess as to what something is. So if you see a, a certain kind of fractal pattern of green, um, you bring an image of tree to it. You're not, you don't really have to see it all. So we take in the minimal amount of information and then we leap to conclusions essentially about what it is. And then there's an error correcting feature. This is kind of the, the, now the prevailing wisdom on how perception works. It's very efficient rather than waiting for all this information to come in and forming a new picture every time. So a lot of what we see is an hallucination, a controlled hallucination basically, um, error corrected. So uh, one of the interesting tests of this is something called the rotating mask experiment. And there's a video, if you, if you look up rotating mask when you get home online, you'll, you'll see this video. But it's um, uh, that, that hollowed out mask that's, you know, the happy, sad theater mask. Um, it's something like that. And uh, it has a, a, con a convex side and a concave side. And uh, as it rotates in space, your mind, it starts out convex, and as you begin to see the back of this face, it pops out again and becomes convex, even though that hasn't really happened. 
your mind refuses to see a face as concave because it never has. Since you were a baby and your mother's breast, your faces have been convex. So it's, you know, it's a very efficient but inaccurate perception. So schizophrenics, it doesn't happen, interestingly enough. Uh, they see the back of the mask. Um, and I had been told by a researcher in Germany that he'd done work, he hadn't published it yet, and it didn't happen with people on psychedelics. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to test this. This will be interesting. So I bring my computer in, and I've queued up the thing, and I tell my guide what I'm doing, and she's a little like, I don't know if, I don't know if this is going to work. It's not really the spirit work. of the uh, adventure. Yeah. Right? So I, you know, after, I'm, uh, after I've gotten a certain amount of lift off, I tried it, and nothing happened. It popped out. And then, I, and then at the peak of the experience, I, I did it like twice, and then at the peak I said, all right, now I should really try it. How does this work again? And I managed to like get it to go, and I looked at it, and it just melted the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> so that was the third variable I hadn't counted on. Um, so I still don't know if this is true. I hope someone else will, will uh, nail this down. But we do know that that is... Uh, the neuroscience of psychedelics has a lot to do with the way it disturbs uh, predictive coding, um, this, I, this, this handshake between our maps of reality and the, and the sensory information we get. So, and it can go in either direction. Um, so for example, you will, uh, your mind will, you know, the, the whole phenomenon of seeing faces in the rain or in the clouds, um, the mind seeing order where it doesn't exist on psychedelics. That's predict predictive coding kind of right. breaking down, the error correction. But the interesting idea here is though that there are some cases where the information that you're getting on psychedelics is more accurate than your everyday perceptions, which are so contaminated by expectation. Right. Um, and that sometimes, there is a kind of um, un untutored seeing that can happen and hearing that can be quite powerful. Is that where some of the beauty is in the experience? I think it is where some of the beauty is. I mean, you know, Aldous Huxley had a beautiful metaphor for what happened. He, you know, um, one of the best books on psychedelics, I think, still to this day is Doors of Perception. It's about his mescaline trip. It's an essay, really. And uh, he said that the, um, the reducing valve uh, of consciousness uh, is opened up. And he points out, and he's right, I mean, this is, science has, has supported this idea that a lot of what consciousness does is filter for us because we would be overwhelmed by the amount of information coming from outside and from inside, from our unconscious, from our bodies. And so, the, so consciousness is very busy as an editor. And basically it admits what he called the measly trickle of information you need to, to be an effective uh, you know, player in Darwinian evolution, you know, things that get the job done, basically help you to reproduce and survive and all these kind of things. And all the information that is extraneous to this is, is hidden from us. Um, and what, and the ego is, is, is really involved in that editing process. The ego walls us from too much information, from our subconscious, from other people. Um, and that goes away on a high dose experience. So the, the valves open wider and more comes in and more comes up. Right. And that's how people can get in touch with, you know, childhood trauma too. Um, you know, it's, it's worth just pausing for a minute to talk about the fact that it's, there are risks involved. These are very consequential drugs and experiences and that um, the bad trip is a real thing and some people who uh, use the drugs, do have psychotic breaks. This has happened. It tends to be people, younger people, who were probably on their way to schizophrenia anyway, and that um, uh, psychedelics, like cannabis and alcohol, can be a trigger. Or like the divorce of your parents, it can be a trigger if it happens at the wrong time. Um, but um, but I, So I look very carefully at the risk profile. And um, so there are psychological risks, uh, they can be mitigated by proper preparation and having a guide and all these kind of things. And, um, uh, and negative experiences can be very productive psychologically. You can learn a lot from them. I'm, I, I've met people who did get in touch with childhood traumas, but it was incredibly therapeutic. They then used that to actually deal with yeah. it, did they? Oh, right. yeah. And, right. um, uh, but the physiological risk is remarkably low. 
I was, this really shocked me, um, that these drugs are essentially, and I'm talking here about psilocybin and LSD, are essentially non-toxic. There is no lethal dose, believe it or not, of LSD and um, psilocybin. And you've got drugs in your medicine cabinet, um, you know, things like Tylenol that do have a lethal dose. It's only a couple dozen pills. Right. Um, so that's remarkable. And they're also not um, habit-forming. Um, and believe me, you, your first thought about uh, after a, a, a powerful Meeting psychedelic trip is, <laughs> do I have to do this again? Um, after six months or so, you may want to do it again, but it's, it's not... Uh, you know, if you set up that classic experiment with the rat in the cage and it's got two choices, yeah. it's got a lever that administers the drug and another lever that administers sugar to its bloodstream, uh, and on cocaine it will do that till it dies, uh, on LSD it'll do it once and never again. <laughs> <laughs> Rats don't like LSD. Just got one more question about... Um, you know, you, you look into the neuroscience in such depth, but you also write this compelling modern history of these figures uh, who have experimented with, whether clinically or in the underground. Um, and of course, a figure that most of us would be very familiar with is that of Timothy Leary. And you very sort of memorably talk about the way in which for um, that most people who take an ego-dissolving psychedelic come out of the experience with a greater sense of humility, but, but people like everybody. Timothy Leary <laughs> come out with perhaps an e even larger ego than before. Um, tell us a little bit about Timothy Leary. And also, are you worried that Timothy, another Timothy Leary will come along and spoil this party that's really just beginning? Yeah. Here? So Timothy Leary, you know, was, a, uh, uh, was an early and serious psychedelic researcher um, who kind of got over-enthusiastic, um, basically. And, and this is an occupational hazard, I think, a uh, rational exuberance about psychedelics. And, and I see it in even some of the researchers who, if you get them out for a drink, will talk about this is the, mankind, need, humankind needs this drug right now to deal with the crisis we're in. But they would never say that, you know, on the record. Um, and so, but everybody's aware of the, the um, the lesson of Timothy Leary, which is to be very careful and not to raise expectations. And so I think the fact that there was a Timothy Leary, will, that history won't repeat itself, just because right. everybody seems hyper aware. I mean, Leary, you know, basically moved from doing research to like, wow, everybody should take this drug. Um, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out. And, um, and that help provoke the backlash. I mean, he's not single-handedly responsible for introducing LSD into the culture. It was happening. But he certainly gave it a big push. Um, and there is this weird paradox, though, of, um, yes, this ego-dissolving experience that in some people leads to ego inflation. And I think it has something to do with having this feeling that you found the key to the universe or the key to human happiness. Powerful. And you've got to tell the world and, and then you become an evangelist. And I think that's, a, that's an occupational hazard for people in this field. But I, I see no signs. I think the people who are doing the work have great humility about what they're doing and enormous sense of caution and not, uh, you know, not raising expectations. Um, and people should be cautious. We're not ready to approve these drugs. They still right. need to go through... Um, larger trials, and those trials are beginning. There are big trials going on in Europe and the United States to test um, uh, psilocybin for depression. There's an alcoholism trial. There's a smoking cessation trial. There's some anorexia work that's going to get started, which I think is very promising. Um, so, but we're not there yet. It's a couple years away. Yeah. Okay, so we can now take some questions from the audience, perhaps. You know, just then you, you mentioned um, that we're not ready for legalization. And I think uh, given your emerging status in this field, that's quite a concerning view to have because um, I think it plays into the idea that drugs are illegal, psychedelics are illegal because of good scientific evidence, because of reason. And we know that that's not the case. Um, we have Richard Nixon's own advisor now having admitted in the public domain that these drugs were made illegal because they wanted to find a way to criminalize black people and conscientious objectors to the war. Let me stop you there. You've said a lot, and, and Michael, I think I'd be happy a lot to, to address the to. issue. Um, and we disagree on the question of legalization right now. Uh, I share your critique of the drug war. I think it's been a disaster. Um, uh, I think 
though, in the case of psychedelics, I support decriminalization. I don't think anyone should go to jail for using a mushroom of any kind. Um, but I think, <laughs> thank you. Based on um, the experience that we've observed with uh, cannabis in the United States, there is a, there's a tendency to think this is the next cannabis. Um, and, um, and I'm just very cautious about that for a couple reasons. One is that when you legalize it, you commercialize it. And these drugs are, are uh, a more serious and, and more risky experience than using cannabis, in my, in my view. And that I see cannabis now being promoted to people, um, being pushed, as, as capitalism will do. Uh, when I come home from this trip on Monday, I'll cross the Bay Bridge coming from the airport to Berkeley and I'll see three or four billboards for companies that will deliver cannabis to my home within two hours. Um, and I just think we don't know enough to, to legalize these drugs. I, again, we should decriminalize them. Um, I also feel very protective of the research um, and I don't think this is it's really a matter of tactics rather than, I mean, in general, I, I, I do think most drugs should probably be legalized, but how exactly, under what kind of structure? Do we know, do we know enough to do that? So I, I'm basically, you know, my position is just a cautionary note that, um, and it's one person's position, and, and you know, we'll, we'll vote on this, and you'll make your case to the public, and I'll make my case, and we'll see what happens. But. Um, our positions are not so far apart. Um, I just think we should start with decriminalization. I think we should complete the research. Uh, I do believe, though, that there, at some point we should figure out a way to make these experiences available to people who are not sick. Um, I think we're all on a continuum with the people who have uh, addiction. We're all addicted to something. We all have periods of depression and anxiety, and we're all going to die and so that these drugs do have value for well people. Uh, the issue is, and this is how it's different than cannabis, is that one of the lessons of psychedelic use we can take from traditional cultures um, who have been using psychedelics for thousands of years, you know, in, in Central America and South America and, and North America, um, is that they're always used in a very careful cultural container. They're never used casually. Uh, people don't take them alone. There's always an elder involved, and there's always a sense, there's always intention involved. Uh, you take it for a reason. And I think we haven't devised that proper container, and I think we need to do that before we legalize it. But I look forward to legalizing it. I'm just, I just not ready to do it now. Just in the last 12 to 18 months, we've, saw, we've seen FDA approval for Sativex, Nepodilex, uh, CBD, marijuana, cannabis, for two rare forms of epilepsy. If you were to put your hand up and say, what is the next FDA approval drug in psychedelics, what molecule would it be and what medical application would that be for? After psilocybin? Because it will, I, it will be psilocybin. Most of the research... After psilocybin, um, actually, I think it'll be MDMA and then psilocybin. I don't know if you consider MDMA, which is ecstasy, uh, a psychedelic, but it looks like that's a little, at least in America, that's kind of ahead. They're, they're in phase three trials already, which is the last step, and um, MDMA is being used to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, that probably will happen before uh, psilocybin. After psilocybin, I don't know. Um, you know, I think that there's a, there's a couple candidates. Um, people talk about DMT as a shorter acting uh, psychedelic that might have some value. Um, you know, one of the challenges with psychedelic therapy is fitting it into the mental health system we have. Uh, it takes a whole day and two therapists, basically, to administer it. Um, and this, this makes it expensive, even though you may only have to do it once. Um, it, it's very hard to fit into the business model of, uh, you know, psychotherapy, which is the weekly appointment that goes on forever and ever and ever. Um, and, and then it's hard to fit into the pharmaceutical model, which is you take a pill every day for the rest of your life. Uh, so, so some people think, well, maybe we should look at DMT, which has a similar risk profile, and see if 
uh, you could get similar event, uh, effects with the same. Um. Ibogaine is another interesting drug. It's a, it's a psychedelic from the root of a shrub in um, Africa, and it seems to have uh, success treating opiate addiction, which is a, a tremendous problem right now in the United States. It's a more toxic drug, though, and it has to be used with a lot more care. You have to be on a heart monitor and things like that. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, the honest answer, I, I don't know, but I, I would look, I guess, at DMT. Thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you. Do we have another? My question is about um, the use of psychedelics um, for the um, betterment of well people. Um, I'm wondering if you can imagine a world, um, and if so, um, what your thoughts are about what a, a world would look like where um, the therapeutic use of psychedelics is a you know, completely normal mainstream thing that people do. Yeah, um, I've thought about that a little bit um, and, you know, and had conversations with people involved in this community and people kind of imagine a sort of mental health spa, um, you know, beautiful places you'd go in the country, you know, designed by Scandinavian architects, um, a lot of blonde wood, where, um, and there would be uh, guides on staff, and there would be a presiding uh, medical officer, chief medical officer, who would actually write the prescriptions, and people could have these experiences in a beautiful setting with um, guidance. Um, that sounds expensive, and I think that that's, an issue, you know, uh, democratizing the experience. Um, and that's why approval as a medicine is so important because presumably, once, at least, I don't know how it works in Australia, but if it's approved as a medicine in the United States, um, th that health insurance uh, providers will have to cover it um, if it's proven to be a superior treatment for depression or addiction. Uh, and that's, that reaches more people. Um, uh, so that's one way. I mean, you know, there will continue to be people who will use the drugs on their own, going to concerts and festivals any, any which way they want. I mean, th it's not hard to get access to these drugs. They're not actually that expensive. Um, but my sense is there's just so much more to be gained and such greater um, safety in using it in this kind of you know, with the kind of cultural container. Uh, I think it's one of, a, it's a really important cultural project over the next so many years is, you know, the shim I mean, many people are having ayahuasca experiences and they have this very exotic container of, you know, of um, uh, shamanic uh, ritual. And, you know, but that's not our culture. Um, and I think, we, we, you know, we, we should be able to come up with something that's culturally appropriate to us that offers the same kind of safety and comfort um, as, you know, but we're new to this. I mean, a, a, an important thing to understand is um, psychedelics arrived in the West very suddenly. That story I told right at the beginning about LSD, and I didn't tell the story of how psilocybin got here, but it wasn't until 1957. Um, and the drugs arrived without any instructions. And, um, and we've been fooling around trying to figure out the best way to use them ever since. We have a medical model now. We have a, a system that seems to work in a therapeutic context. We have a religious model. Uh, in America, there are two ayahuasca churches that have the right to administer ayahuasca. And the Native Americans can use peyote, all, all protected by law. But then there's the rest of us in the middle. Um, and now it's up to us uh, to figure out what is the best, safest, most productive way to use these chemicals. And, um, and I know we can figure it out, but I, but I don't think we have quite yet. I think that is the perfect note to end on. Thank you Aww. so much, Michael Pollan. Please oh, join thank me you. in thanking Michael Pollan. Thank you very much. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.